Hi, this is Dave from Steel City Drones Flight Academy, and today I have with me Michael McVeigh from Florida Drone Supply, who takes care of all of our vending needs, but also Michael is one of my flight instructors from my flight school. And one of the very big questions we always get from law enforcement agencies is, do I need a COA, or should I use a COA or not use a COA, or should I fly under 107, or or what the what you know what that case may be? There's a lot of different things that go into that, so we want to try to walk you guys through that process as much as possible, just to clarify everything. And you know, Michael, I guess the very first part we should start with is let's talk about 107. When's it appropriate and when's it not appropriate? You need to look at it about do you have to fly in controlled airspace or do you need to fly over people? Those are the two limiting factors on 107. So if you need to fly in controlled airspace, you can go ahead and use the land system and basically get an airspace authorization rather easily. However, as we're gonna show you, every controlled tower has one of these maps. And there's gonna be some limitations as to the height, as the closer you get to the airport, how high you can fly, and in some instances, you're not gonna be able to fly at all. It's gonna be zero altitude. Yep. So what that means then, you won't be able to get an instant. You would have to use a, apply for a waiver. And a certificate of waivers for airspace can be, I mean, we've seen some take up to 16 months and there's no guarantee that you can get them. And obviously, we don't know anybody who has to be able to, to wait 16 months, especially for first right. responders. You need to use, you need it now. So. A COA may be appropriate for that circumstance. The other one would be if you have to fly over people and they may want that uh, freedom because it is rather difficult right now to get a certificate of waiver under 107 for flying over people. Right. Obviously we have this right now here, this nice little parachute system that we've come up with um, that we're recommending to law enforcement agencies for flying directly over people as well as an added you know, for risk management, another safety margin. So if you guys are interested in something like looking at that, we have another video for you about that. If you are fit in one of those categories where the COA may be uh, beneficial, let's talk about what that is, what the process is, and how we get there. Yep, so if you decide you're gonna fly with a COA, the first thing that you'll have to do is write a letter uh, to the FAA and probably it comes from your city attorney or your local uh, mu municipality attorney and it's a declaration letter and basically you're going to tell the FAA that you want to be able to fly in your airspace and you're going to take responsibility for all the flights in the airspace, the safety of it, the training of your people and you're essentially going to take all of the FAA's requirements in-house and you'll be responsible for that. Exactly. So where that letter has to come from is if you have a, uh, in the city area where you have a district attorney's office, it would come from your district attorney. You can't send it directly to the FAA. They, they won't accept that. So it has to come from one of those ends legally. Once they look at that, they probably take a few weeks to look at that over. And then if there's, they, don't, they don't see any red flags with that, then they will give you the access to the portal site. And that's where you can then officially do the requesting process. So do you want to talk about, so once um, the agency has access to the portal, would you like to talk about a little bit then about what goes on from there? Sure, so once the FAA gets your letter, they're gonna give you access to a portal called CAPS. CAPS is where you'll make your application. You'll explain the circumstances for what you need. You'll explain the areas that you wanna fly in. And you'll basically go through all your department or your division's requirements plans and airspace needs and that's submitted electronically to the FAA and that's when they get all the information they will evaluate your application come back with questions and then ultimately hopefully grant you your co-op. Now let's talk about the types of COAs. There's two different type of COAs that you can apply for. One is called a blanket COA 
and one is a jurisdictional uh, COA. And a blanket COA is where you don't need to fly in controlled airspace. You can basically get more of a larger blanket of an area that will cover that uh, your jurisdiction if you don't have to, if it's not in controlled airspace. If you are, so basically what they're saying is you need to stay five nautical miles away from all controlled towered airports and also have a limitation for nighttime operations. It has to be limited to daytime operations. So if you need to fly at night or you need to have uh, the ability to fly near controlled airports, you then need to apply for a jurisdictional COA. Now, jurisdictional COA will allow you to be able to have that, uh, that, that ability to do one of those two things. But some people think that I want to go ahead and apply for that COA because I don't want to get my officers to get that 107 training. There is no such thing as a free lunch with the FAA. Your officers still have to be trained. So let's take a look at some of the training requirements for the COA. If you don't know how to start your own internal drone training or drone program, Steel City Drones specializes in helping clients develop a complete internal program that not only meets the FAA requirements, but exceeds them in every aspect. On the COA process, you have to actually explain in detail your training program, how your officers are getting trained, and then once you have to show that your officers are trained, then your COA will allow you to fly in and use that COA fully functional. And to be honest with you, the need to understand airspace is still there as well. The training aspect is still there if you want to use the COA, and in many ways it might be even a little more training. Um, Michael, we want to talk about how some law enforcement agencies will use a combination of both. Yeah, so you can have both a Part 107, your officers could have a Part 107, and your department could have a co-op, and there'll be some times where if you need to go in an area outside of your COA, and it's an area that a Part 107 pilot could fly a regular commercial operation in, having a Part 107 pilot on your force or on your staff, they can go fly that commercial operation wherever that space is. So maybe you get called yeah. out to a different area, it's an area outside your normal mission area, and you don't, your COA doesn't cover that area for you, yeah. but a Part 107 can fly anywhere that the airspace would allow during the day. Some of the other things with the COA that you have to do, you have to do monthly reports. Um, they really prefer you to also file a NOTAM before you fly. So lots of moving parts here. Yep. Um, and you know, we just like to have, we don't want to throw out a really, just a quick video explaining that further with you. And like I said, if you have any further questions, we'll be glad to walk you through that process. We've done this many times with our clients. And like always, feel, feel free to reach out to us and Thanks again for watching.